those of you watching on, well, there it goes. The light just came on. Hello, everybody. I'm Marky e. Bilson, your voice of choice for a new generation of Tri-City Sports fans. The name of the program, Tri-City Sports Now, where we own the Tri-Cities with the best guests, hardest hitting opinions in the market. Uh, I'm the most outspoken member of the Tri-City Sports Media. I'm also dressed like Colonel Sanders today with my white suit on and all this for those radio listeners out there. Today's show, tomorrow's the start of baseball season in the Appalachian League. And, you know, we had all the drag races in Bristol this past weekend. We have the World Cup going on, we the U.S. Open. And you know what? I want to know what's going on in baseball. And to me, I mean, it just doesn't, you know, to, to me, I, I'm like, you know, that's all well and good. It's wonderful. I don't really, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't supplant baseball. At my root, I am a baseball fan. That's my favorite sport. Football, a very close number two. But yeah, I will say that uh, there is something better about baseball in that it doesn't leave the players with CTE. And we can talk about how soccer is taking over and how, you know, uh, the NHRA in Bristol, well, that's local. And I guess we can go, but to me, yes, it's fun visually to go to the drag races. I've been there. It's a good event. But uh doesn't capture the soul like baseball. It isn't the think sport like baseball is. And so today we're going to have on two big-time baseball guests. Justin Rock, who is used to be the voice of the Johnson City Cardinals. Now he's the voice of the Greenville Reds. You know, I always talk about the Appalachian League, mom and pop, all that sort of stuff. And one of the reasons why is we don't really know who the players are going to be, even right now. Well, Justin's going to come on and tell us who's going to play where for the Greenville Reds this year, the newest team in the Appalachian League. And the one that I think, although with Boyd Sports, and Boyd Sports is running Greenville as well, uh, Johnson City has certainly, you know, grown leaps and bounds with uh, Boyd Sports. They're drawing more fans than they ever had before. Greenville traditionally leading the Appalachian League in attendance when they came into the league. They've got the best facility, I think. Nothing against uh, Hunter Wright Stadium in Kingsport, or really even, and I know they call it after a bank or something like that, but uh, Cardinal Park. It's always going to be Cardinal Park. Door. I mean, you know, you can call, you know, the old Phillies ballpark, Connie Mack Stadium, all you want at Shibe Park. You know, that's, that's the way it is. Anyway... The circumstances that Justin Rock will be joining us. And then, if all goes well at 1.30, I'm going to talk to Jared Diamond. Jared Diamond penned a piece in Wall Street Journal this past Friday that had a lot of people buzzing and buzzing and buzzing about. Not just the sports talk market, but also I heard the general talk show hosts. Getting it wrong, but uh, I heard them talk about what's, you know, that baseball is suffering from an enormous attendance decline this year. I mean, it's almost 10%. Why? And that's what I'm going to talk about. Jared Diamond wrote that piece in the Wall Street Journal, and I'm going to talk to him at 1.30 if all goes well. He just came in, got, a, uh, got the email just uh, a little bit ago, I said, when can you come on? And he says, yeah, I can come on 1.30 today. Let's do it. This is the biggest fan decline, and in some ways it even exceeds the fan decline in 1995 when baseball was coming back from that hideous strike. Canceled the World Series. Montreal Expos don't get a chance to play in a World Series, right? And, you know, my, my, Matt Williams didn't have a chance to break Roger Maris's home run record legitimately. 
Tony Gwynn didn't have a chance to hit 400. Finished 394. There, the Indians were destined. They were in second place at the time. It would have been the first wild card. They hadn't made the playoffs, you know, in 40 years. That would have been a storyline along with the Expos. The Yankees were back. They're the official American League champion because they were the team with the best record in the American League when play stopped. Of course, there was always the American League West going back then where the Rangers were leading at 10 games under 500, but hey, we can't have everything, right? Anyway, point is, after that, you heard after the World Series was canceled, a lot of people, I mean a lot of people were saying, I'm never going to watch baseball again. And myself, Mr. Baseball, I just, you know, it's like, you know, telling me I'm never going to speak to my family member again. Come on. Won't, won't stop, you know. The problem is, if you look at baseball ratings before the strike for the World Series, after the strike, they were just about halved. And they still are. And I think the postseason is too long. But, I mean, now we're going to talk about here, I'm going to begin the show talking about what's wrong with baseball. I mean, I, I turn on games this year, and a quick look at the stands, any game reveals numerous empty seats. It's not just the bad teams that have a attendance decline. And we can talk about, you know, Miami, Baltimore, those teams are down. You expect those teams to be down. You know, they're losing. Thing is, the Pirates started the year in first place, and their attendance is way down. The Cleveland Indians have been in first place all year long. They've made the playoffs two straight years, should have sold a lot of season tickets. Their attendance is down. The Seattle Mariners are having their best year in 16 years. There should be a real big, yeah, let's go watch the M's and fall in love with them all over again, just like the Braves had in 1991, and there isn't. Cubs are down, Nationals are down, Red Sox are down, Phillies are down, all of them are having good years. Cardinals are down. Braves are up 1,500 fans. This after, you know, having a remarkable turnaround. Now, a lot of people are talking about weather, but I'm going to tell you this. Walk-up tickets are only a minimal part of attendance, which is counted as tickets sold in baseball. No shows are still put into a baseball team's attendance figure. It wasn't always that way in the National League, but then again, we really don't have a National League anymore. I mean, we have one major league office. It's not like it was up until Bud Selig took over. You know, I mean, you used to have two competing leagues, much like, let's say, the American and the National Football Leagues were in the 60s. That was the way, and they met in the World Series. I mean, you know, get... But there was real league rivalry back then. I'm going to get to that here in a second. Baseball tickets now for the good seats, the premium seats, okay, box seats and, you know, thereabouts. You know what the average cost in a major league ballpark is for a premium seat? $114.50. By the way, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers season ticket holder. I pay less than $90 a seat. That's outrageous. I do sit in the upper deck. But I've got a 30-yard line seat. We can discuss whether or not that is a premium ticket or not. It is way up high. It is underneath an overhang. So if it rains, I don't get rained on. I like that. But I want $140, or excuse me, $114 a ducat for premium seats. You want to talk about why baseball attendance is down. If you want to sit in the bleachers, you want non-premium seats. Hey, I'll have that $5. You know, I used to sit there. Sure. Average cost of a non-premium seat, Major League Baseball, 32 bucks. That's not, you know, I mean, I know that they're going to, well, I mean, that's what? I mean, you know, more than three hours work for a lot of people, if you think about it. I mean, if you want, if you made minimum wage... Yeah, that's more than a half a day's work. Even before you go into the expenses of food and transportation to the ballpark and all of that. And if you're a Braves fan, where they've built a ballpark in the suburbs, so you basically need to drive to the game. It's an $18 parking charge for the seats that shuttle you to the ballpark. 
like an airport or something at SunTrust Park. 18 extra bucks for nothing. And really, that's a modest parking fee in a lot of places. So, even trying to follow baseball without going to the ballpark, that's become costly. When I was a kid, how did I do it? You know, you had Game of the Week and, you know, ESPN in 1990 and all that. But no, you also had, you know, the local teams broadcast over the air. Reds always seemed to. If you had cable, you could watch the Braves every day, certainly. But uh, AM radio dial. Tuning in that faraway broadcast. When it got dark, certainly. But this is an era where we don't really, you know, scan our AM dial so much anymore to listen to Larry King. Obviously, you can't do that. He's no longer on overnight. We are, you know, when we want to listen to an out-of-town radio station, hey, we can do it in the daytime. It's called streaming, right? And there are a lot of teams that used to be on 50,000-watt powerhouses that aren't anymore. I mean, the Indians, the Reds are, I think uh, St. Louis, but a lot of these teams are now on FM stations. You can only get locally. That's their flagship. You know, there are far fewer teams on that blowtorch that goes out through 38 states in Africa, Canada or wherever it is than there used to be. You can still listen at night to the Reds on, you know, WLW if you are so inclined or the Indians on WTAM, formerly 3WE. That's a long time ago. Can't listen to the Pirates, though, let's say, on uh, KDKA 1020. They're on FM. I think the Phillies are on FM, too. They used to be on 1210. You used to be able to listen to those guys all the time. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a loss on this in, in terms of where we can listen to the ball game, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you want to even listen online, there's a fee for that. You want to watch the games online, heaven help you if it's in your own market, then it gets blacked out, and it's about 25 bucks a month or so, or you can get the season, but, but MLB TV, oh, you get all the games, but it's rather expensive. In an era of cord cutting, yeah, that 25 bucks a month, let's say, to watch Major League Baseball, um, it's become boxing. You know, there was a time where you were going to go. This is a long time ago. It's before my time. But uh, what? Frazier's fighting Ali? Let's go to the closed circuit theater and watch that fight. Let's pay it. Then there was pay-per-view. You did that maybe once, maybe twice, and then, you know what? It's a lot of money to pay on a sport that, you know, it's kind of dying. Where's the action sometimes? You get an early knockout. Did I get my money's worth? It became a huge amount of cynicism. Do I really want to line Don King's pocket? That sort of thing. And so we started to learn that we could do without boxing. Hey, even now, I got to get up HBO to watch it, right? Well, what if I don't have HBO? I don't really want to pay for the station of Bill Maher. What if you're that guy, which is about half the country? Now, one of the things that kills baseball, it's controlled by its union, and the union is doing for baseball what the UAW did for Detroit. But baseball may be the only sport that has been legitimately attacked by its commissioners. Bud Selig gave an interview to John Feinstein, friend of the show, late in his tenure, saying he had to change things about baseball because we were doing things the way we were back in the days of the polo grounds. I remember the quote very well in the interview. And Selig made this statement, you know, in an exasperated fashion. Oh, we were doing things I did back in the days of the polo grounds. Polo grounds was torn down in 1964, by the way. It's where the New York Giants played before they moved to San Francisco. Uh, and the implication was things had to be changed, but he didn't say what had to be changed. And frankly, I think most fans look back to baseball of the Polo Grounds era, be it Willie, Mickey, and the Duke, be it, I don't know, the era of John McGraw and Christy Mathewson, for that matter, and they look at it in a romantic way. And 
the modern day fan doesn't look at baseball in the modern way, in, in that romantic way. But I, I thought about this and I said, you know, baseball in 1964. Well, you can't do it that way anymore. But I think most people think that baseball was better in 1964 than it was in 2018. Hear me out. True champions. You had to win your league to go to the postseason. When it was the World Series, you knew the two best teams were playing. Games were faster placed. 1964, they took less than two and a half hours to play. Look it up. You know, every team's announcer, and even the national broadcasters, I mean, Dizzy Dean, come on, they had a style that was like music. ESPN has kind of made the baseball broadcaster into an android now. There's exceptions, you know, Tom Elton, certainly John Sterling has a style, you know, and all. And I do think the local broadcaster has a style, you know, if you will. But it isn't similar to the days of, say, you know, Lindsey Nelson or Bob Prince or Harry Callas or even, a you know, Mel Allen, somebody like that, that you would listen to on your 50,000-watt radio station, Skip, Pete, and Ernie. Nothing against what Jim Powell and Don Sutton do. I like them a lot, but yeah, still. Anyway, you had true championship games that are faster pace. Every team's announcer had a style that was like music instead of the ESPN Andrew, Android sportscaster. Here's something the hometown star stayed with the team. There's no free agency then. You had balanced schedules. You know, on the day of 154, it's 11 on the road, 11 at home against every team. And even though you didn't have divisions, you did for scheduling purposes where, look this up, if the... Let's, and I'm going to go back to before the Braves were in Atlanta, and I know to some people that's like talking Greek, but let's talk about the Boston Braves. Okay, Yeah, that's a long time ago. Don't get me wrong, okay? But the schedule in that era was perfect. And so if it was Brooklyn and New York, you knew it was Braves versus Phillies. It's the way the schedule worked out. If it was Cardinals and Cubs, you knew it was the Ohio River rivalry. Pirates and Reds. That's the way it worked out. When the Braves moved to Milwaukee, then, okay, Pittsburgh became a Eastern team. Braves-Phillies, that's a pretty good rivalry. That was going on whenever it was Giants-Dodgers, at least in New York. And the World Series was obviously the biggest game of the year. I mean, there was a reason why baseball was so popular. It was perfect. And now this game that was free of gimmicks, the commissioners insist on putting a mustache on the Mona Lisa, and they insist on any gimmick they can come up with. Now, uh, I'm a big critic of the DH rule. I think it's become, I think it's the worst rule that has ever happened to baseball. It's made the game last an hour and a half on average longer than when it was instituted, at least. I mean, last year, games were 305. Before the DH, they were 227. It gave us the pitch count. There were actually pitch counts even before then. I can show you a game Robin Roberts lost to the Braves on a walk-off home run years and years ago. He threw 170 pitches. Somehow he was able to pitch for 20 years. But he gave us pitch counts, which is sort of like the global warming of baseball. Mid-inning pitching change. It's not like it never happened, but they are much more commonplace when you, hmm, we got to let him go because you know, he's due up second in the next inning. I can pinch it for him then. I don't want to, you know, I want a hitter to come up then. The other thing DH did, the image of the baseball player being less than an athlete, hey, he's one-dimensional. It destroyed the beautiful symmetry of nines and threes in the game. Now we want to have seven inning games, my goodness. It catered to the most damning of mindsets because while the pitcher's, yeah, traditionally the worst hitter on a team, although there are exceptions that we can put out, doesn't a rule stating a certain position can't hit create prejudice? Doesn't that happen? You know, I gotta take a break here. 
And I did write a very long-winded commentary, I'm going to be honest with you, but when I heard that the attendance was so down, and I'm not surprised at all, it just made me go on a rant. And I really feel like, you know, a parent looking at their child, you know, something that I love so much like baseball, and I really think that it has the appearance of, like I said, just a child destroying themselves. I think a sport is destroying itself. I'll tell you more why after this on Tri-City Sports Now.